Episode 10 of Season 2 was titled Act of Love, and it focused on Sue Ellen finally breaking down after years of JR's abuse and having an affair with Cliff Barnes. And I would like to propose a toast to J.R. Ewing. Oh, going off to Washington to do whatever it is he pretends to do. For Love or Money is a direct sequel to that episode and offers some fascinating insight into why Sue Ellen would ever allow herself to be subjected to that kind of treatment in the first place. What I am looking at is how hard you have worked to turn me into the perfect wife for him. And I succeeded. And the title refers to a choice that multiple characters must make. Sue Ellen is trying to manage the expectations of her overbearing mother Patricia, played here by the fantastic Martha Scott. Patricia wants Sue Ellen to show kid sister Kristen the ropes of the Dallas social scene. When the time is right, I'll make sure that Kristen meets someone. Part of that social scene are the daughters of the Alamo, who are planning some civic activism over brunch. It's here where we meet Fern Fitzgerald's Marilee Stone for the first time, a character who's going to be a major player in the coming seasons. The DOA fawn over how well Sue Ellen is dealing with the pregnancy. Sue Ellen says that JR is so excited that he's trying to secure a future for the baby by closing a deal in Austin. Wouldn't you know it though, the ladies pass JR as he's entertaining a lovely young woman in the hotel lobby. The women make sure to twist the knife in Sue Ellen as they pass. You know if Sue Ellen hadn't told us JR was in Austin, I'd have sworn that was him. Hey, it's just me. Uh, I'm editing the latest Dallas video. And I need kind of a favor from you. Uh, how do I know when the C word is justified? In like a specific situation? No, I don't think that would be strong enough. Well, I don't want to say it, it's just I don't know how else to describe this behavior. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Well, Sue Ellen's out with her friends, and they spot JR, and then her friends are, like, really passive-aggressive about him cheating on her, and it's, like, this whole big thing. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. Special exemption... From women's community. Okay, and I just download the PDF. Okay, love you. Bye. Why do they need my social? You know what? It's not worth it. Sue Ellen is humiliated, and it's worth noting Mara Lee's knowing look as they exit. Meanwhile, Pamela helps Cliff change his fashion sense in anticipation of the upcoming election but the big-time oil and construction barons offer him an even better deal. Head of the Office of Land Management. Essentially, Cliff Barnes would oversee every major land deal in Texas and control land use, including oil exploration. And all he'd have to do in return is occasionally condemn the houses of poor people so that the cabal can make millions in developing the land. We condemn them, you build them, and there's a quick few million dollars profit. It's free real estate. While this scene is a bit on the nose, its premise is so well established in election that it works here. Cliff still clings to the self-delusion that he has principles, so he storms out. But the developers already know he's taking the bait. Sue Ellen finally confronts JR directly about his infidelities, and he tells her that there's nothing that she can do about it, so he's going to continue doing whatever he wants. JR dares her to leave and warns her that she's leaving the prestige and money behind. Sue Ellen rushes into the arms of Cliff Barnes, who is hesitant to take up with her again. She implies that she's going to use him to get back at JR, and he seems okay with that. At breakfast the following morning, JR makes some excuse about Sue Ellen's absence. Oh, I don't know. Some sort of ladies' affairs. I don't pay much attention to her, Lucy. Talk turns to the shepherds, and JR makes a telling comment about Patricia's planning out of Kristen's entire life. Her mother's got that girl's life pretty well planned out. 
He drops in on the shepherds looking for Sue Ellen. Patricia treats her own son-in-law like a celebrity in her own home, while Kristen, played here by Colleen Camp, openly flirts with him. Think I look like Sue Ellen? There's a resemblance, that's for sure. Bobby catches Sue Ellen leaving, which, of course, is the worst possible scenario. Bobby tries to keep her from leaving, but she's adamant. When JR gets home, he tells Bobby to mind his own business. Which is, you know, kind of valid, actually. Sue Ellen shows up at her mom's, and it's here where the character dynamics kick into high gear. We learn that after the death of Sue Ellen's father, Mrs. Shepard groomed both of her daughters to be trophy wives for powerful men. When your father died, that's all I devoted my life to. Kristen is still incubating, and we get an interesting tug-of-war for Kristen's soul. Sue Ellen tries to dissuade her from following the same path. JR doesn't seem all that bad to me. It's too late for Kristen, though. Both Patricia and Kristen shrug off JR's infidelities, because that's just the price you pay for the prestige and security of being married to a wealthy man. This scene speaks volumes about the way that the Shepherd women view the world, and it unlocks a key piece of Sue Ellen's character. When we first meet Sue Ellen and Digger's daughter, she doesn't get much character development at all. In fact, according to Dallas Lore, the writers weren't even sure who she was at that point. She was, rather famously, just a brunette on the couch. Once they decided that she was JR's wife and that JR was a philanderer, everything else fell into place. JR's infidelities were exposed in Winds of Vengeance, but Sue Ellen lacked both the confidence and the awareness to leave him. I say awareness because of this very scene. Often, too often, the victim of an abusive relationship doesn't even consider leaving as an option. A sort of blind spot to separation develops. For Sue Ellen, it was given to her by her mother. I mentioned in the review for Survival that Sue Ellen's character development this season had to do with her own sense of self, and how your self is divided into three components. Self-awareness, self-concept, and self-esteem. A person's self-esteem is made up of two parts your ideal self, which is the best version of you that you can imagine, and the ought self, which is the version of you that you feel obligated to be. The farther your perceived reality from either of these things, the lower your self-esteem. For Sue Ellen, she never developed an ideal self of her own. She never had a person she wanted to be. She was what Patricia wanted her to be, and then she was what JR wanted her to be. It wasn't until Pamela moved in and became a strong role model for Sue Ellen that she started to develop wants and needs of her own. This is, among other Barnes-related reasons, why JR is so adamant about breaking up Pam and Bobby. A lot of what we've seen in Season 2 is the breaking down of Sue Ellen as a person, and we see her built up as a different person in Seasons 3 and 4, which leads me to this controversial hot take about the 40-year-old show. Dallas is Sue Ellen's show. JR may be the pop culture icon. The show may have been conceived around Pam and Bobby, but Sue Ellen's arc is the one that drives the narrative through the first few seasons. He said uh, that I'm pregnant. JR is the same guy in episode 100 as he is in episode 1, just with a little more lead in him. Pam and Bobby mostly just react to situations they're in. But Sue Ellen changes over time. I know the sequel series is controversial among the fandom, but by the time it rolls around, Sue Ellen is a power player running for governor of the state of Texas. That is a serious shift in power. And for Lover Money is a crucial point along Sue Ellen's path as we see her beginnings. I've talked before about motif and theme. The overarching theme of this season is the effect the want of money has on people who don't have it. When Maynard Anderson kicks her to the curb, Jenna Wade tries a soft extortion racket on Bobby. Ed Haynes also tries to extort money from Pamela. Rita Briggs is willing to sell her own baby on the black market. Garnet McGee sells out a man who loves her for a recording contract. And the female kidnapper tells Bobby her motive is grinding poverty. And that doesn't even begin to touch the main characters. Cliff Barnes is so destroyed by JR stealing the election out from under him that he's finally open to selling his soul. And Sue Ellen feels trapped in an abusive relationship because she can't imagine a life without JR's money. Goodbye. Everything. But the reason for that is because her mother treated her like a product for sale molding her to be the perfect trophy wife so that she could use her to anchor herself to a rich family. There's nothing wrong with being married to a wealthy man. When we see her doing the same thing to Kristen, we recoil, because this lady is basically acting like a cat house madam for her own daughters. That's in keeping with the season's theme, though. Patricia explains that she stayed with her husband even though he doesn't sound like much of a provider, and when he died, they had nothing to show for it, so 
In her own way, she's trying to ensure her daughters don't suffer the same paycheck-to-paycheck -paycheck fate that she did. In true jock fashion, he storms into the office and tells JR to cut out all the foolishness and brings Huellen home. This would feel a lot more heroic if Jock didn't openly say that it's because he wants the baby at South Fork. Sue Ellen is just kind of a broodmare, I guess. Sue Ellen finally summons the gumption, the gall, the chutzpah, the fortitude to knock on Cliff's door and tell him that she's leaving JR. Cliff's reaction is the opposite of whatever you'd want to hear in that situation. Okay. What do you want me to say? I get that he's hesitant to take up with Sue Ellen because he thinks she's using him against JR, but she openly just gave up being a millionaires. A little enthusiasm would be nice, Clifford. The other shoe finally drops as JR's private investigator drops the bomb of all bombs. The man who Sue Ellen has been cheating with this whole time is Cliff Barnes. I suppose it's time we do something about old Cliff Barnes. Pamela pops in on Cliff for lunch and notices Sue Ellen's shawl laying on Cliff's couch. So JR and Pamela come to the same knowledge almost simultaneously through vastly different approaches. What was Sue Ellen doing here? Pamela warns Cliff to stay away from Sue Ellen, but Cliff stands his ground and tells her to mind her own business. After Pamela storms out, we find that Sue Ellen was hiding the whole time. They don't know that we know they know we know. <laughs> Bobby, of course, immediately blames Pam's job for her mood, but she just cryptically throws shade at her brother. This is one of my least favorite types of scenes in Dallas. Pamela, who is nearly 30 years old at this point, suddenly comes to the realization that people are nuanced in their morality, and Bobby has to treat her like a child who learned that the Tooth Fairy isn't real. The big muckamucks in the Evil League of Evil let Cliff know that the offer is still on the table. Literally. And Sue Ellen laments the dissolution of her marriage to JR as she looks at their wedding photos. In a strangely out-of-character moment for JR, he confronts Cliff directly about the affair and threatens him with ruining his reputation. After all, JR says, the public will put up with basically anything from a businessman, but a scandal will destroy a politician. The affair would basically make Cliff too toxic for the OLM position as well. So Cliff is faced with the decision of the episode's title, take the money or take the girl. And Sue Ellen doesn't even get that kindness. JR openly threatens to put Sue Ellen through a forced abortion and then leave her penniless on the street. Finally, we're left with what may be the series' most frustrating and heartbreaking scene to date as a spineless Cliff tells Sue Ellen he can't be with her, because JR was mean to him. Look, I don't know what to say. Uh, maybe you can't fight City Hall? A broken Sue Ellen realizes she's just a pawn in the chess match between these two pieces of human garbage and her thousand-yard stare as JR twists the knife by dragging her back home and telling her he'll still be cheating on her is just... devastating. Oh, by the way, I've got a late meeting in Dallas tonight after dinner. No need you waiting up for me. In the coda to the episode, the pinstripe suit filled with gelatin that goes by the name Cliff Barnes accepts the offer to head the OLM and be a puppet. Wow. Okay, so where to start without making this video as long as the episode? Too late! I already did a mid-video deep dive into Sue Ellen's identity, but just as a follow-up to that, is this episode where Linda Gray just starts owning every episode she's featured in. Her performances were always solid, but Sue Ellen's arc becomes far and away the most fascinating thing the show has to offer over the next few seasons. And you would think that this is just Sue Ellen's lowest point, but you still have about a third of the season to go. Now to be clear, there's nothing really wrong about choosing a career over a relationship. People do it all the time. It's the reason Cliff chooses the job over Sue Ellen that makes him so slimy. It's the fact that he openly sells out his morals and makes a decision he knows to be morally wrong in exchange for power that makes him so craven. If Election was the episode that shattered Cliff Barnes' soul into a million pieces, then for Lover Money is JR coming through with a leaf blower to push those pieces into the sewer. And the thing is, all of this Machiavellian scheming on Cliff's part is completely understandable with his backstory. Cliff grew up with a broken, alcoholic single father who did nothing but fill his head with stories about the evil Ewings robbing them of their birthright. In Cliff's mind, he's not scheming for himself. He's scheming on behalf of an old man who gets the DTs without a bottle of bourbon handy. Without power, Cliff has to forego the revenge he thinks Digger deserves and accept that his father will die a penniless drunk, begging people for quarters so he can drink his pain away. So as hard as I criticize Cliff Barnes in this episode, and I'm right to do so, 
The choice in his mind isn't Sue Ellen or the job, it's Sue Ellen or Digger. And in that context, it makes a lot of sense why he'd make the choice he made. The subplot of this episode involves the introduction of Kristen Shepard, Sue Ellen's scheming sexpot of a sister. She's played here and for the rest of season two by Colleen Camp. The casting of Camp seemed like a natural fit, as she was gaining a reputation as the sex kitten in softcore thrillers like Death Game and her various TV guest spots. And Camp certainly has the assets to capture JR's attention. Camp just looks bored here though, and there's no life to her performance. It's not that she's a bad actor, and in fact she's still working to this day, but watching her inert performance and then seeing Mary Crosby sink her teeth into the role, you get why they dodged a bullet. I've talked at length in past episodes about shadow selves and how characters are often introduced to highlight the flaws or characteristics of one of the main cast. Seeing Sue Ellen's mother coaching Kristen to seduce a rich man like some twisted combination of the bachelor meets toddlers and tiaras comes off as child abuse and we get a sense of what Sue Ellen's teen years must have been like. Oh, I do understand. You ticked off because you caught him cheating on you. You're leaving a lot behind just to get exclusive rights. But again, context is important. And what we can glean from Patricia's mid-episode monologue is that she hitched her wagon to her own personal Cliff Barnes. I stayed with your father, though he had far less to offer than J.R. Because no matter whose it is, you're not going to leave J.R. and South Fork and all that money for me. And much like Ellie Southworth, Patricia Shepard didn't have a lot of options to avoid poverty. Drought, depression. My family was going to lose this ranch. You married Jack, you in to save all this? If Lucy gets married, it won't be to make a new business move. Why not, Miss Ellie? You did the same thing. I did exactly what I wanted to. It's important to remember that in 1971, the same year that J.R. married Sue Ellen, the Supreme Court of the United States gave women equal treatment in owning estates and attaining lines of credit, something vital to owning a house or a business and something we take for granted today. There are worse things to live with. The underlying theme of the season about the haves and the have-nots never really gets wrapped up thematically because to do so would destroy any sympathy for the Ewings. Anything you want, you buy. You think there's nothing your money can't buy you. But its omnipresence can't be ignored in an analysis of the show. The bottom line is that, in Dallas as in life, there are people who make good choices, and there are people who have good choices. <laughs>